Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our uh, first press conference of the day. I'm Becca from the ADU Media Relations Office. Uh, our first event will be a press conference uh, titled Explaining the Extreme Events of 2020 from a Climate Perspective. We will begin with each of the panelists giving brief presentations describing their work, and then we'll open it up to questions from reporters. We will end on the hour or when there are no further questions, whichever comes first. And on-site reporters will be able to meet with on-site panelists in the quiet room in room R05, next to the press room on the second floor, following this press conference. Reporters, because this is a Zoom webinar, you won't be able to turn on your video or microphone. So for asking questions, we would like you to use the Q&A box, not the chat box, but the Q&A box. And there you can type your full name and affiliation, and we will invite you to unmute yourself uh, in the order that the request to ask a question were received. Um, alternatively, if you don't want to ask your question verbally, uh, in addition to typing your full name and affiliation, you can type your complete question into the chat and Liza will pose it to uh, the panelists on your behalf. That's my colleague Liza at AGU. Um, please uh, note that you can write in your question at any time, uh, but we won't ask any questions of the panelists uh, until the Q&A session and they will not respond directly into it in the chat to any inquiries. Um, reporters, please also make sure that your Zoom name is accurate in the list. This just helps us find you more quickly to unmute you during the Q&A session. The slides and any additional materials from this uh, press conference will be posted to the Press Information Exchange on AGU Connect, and we'll drop a link to that in the chat. Uh, the press conference is being recorded, and that will be posted to our AGU channel, as well as being linked to in the Press Information Exchange. Please bear with us for any technical difficulties arise. If Zoom does go down for some reason, uh, we will switch to presenting this press conference through a teleconference line. If that happens, we will immediately email the panelists and attendees with instructions for accessing that teleconference line. If you have any technical issues during this uh, press conference otherwise, please email news at agu.org and we can uh, assist you as best we can. And with that, I will turn it over to our panelists. Great, thank you, Rebecca. Um, so thank you for joining this press conference for the release of the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society's annual report explaining extreme events of 2020 from a climate perspective. My name is Stephanie Herring and I am with NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information and I am an editor on the report. And I'm joined today by three other panelists who comprise of both contributing authors and editors. Next slide. Um, so this, rep this report is published by, um, by BAMS, and it, it is in its 10th year. Um, looking back when this report started in 2011 with just a few studies, the intent was to catalyze the science between event attribution su studies. And 10 years later, it is exciting to be able to say that we have seen an increase in the confidence with, with, with which attribution assessments can be made and the speed at which a study can be accomplished. In this year's report, we actually include six articles on how different what are referred to as timely attribution efforts are being approached from around the world, including here in the US. And later in this panel, you will hear from John Nielsen Gammon and Freddie Otto on how the field is moving toward more real-time attribution studies. Next slide. As for this year's report, uh, it includes events from around the world, as always. Over 89 authors from 10 different countries contributed to 17 papers that studied the extent to which human-caused climate change impacted a specific extreme event. A few highlights of the results from this year include a study of the 2020 Kyushu flooding in Japan, which killed 65 people and was made 15% more likely because of climate change. Wildfires in Siberia during the summer of 2020 were up to 80% more likely than a century ago as a result of global warming. And as you will hear from the next panelist, the multi-year drought in the Southwestern US was deepened and intensified by climate change. 2020 was also the warmest year on record for Europe in May 2020 tied for the hottest on record for the globe. This combination resulted in record highs in May 2020 in Western Europe. And these were found to be 40% more likely due to climate change. Next slide. 
It's important to note that while these individual studies um, are, are helpful for understanding how specific events may have played out, these 17 new papers are just the latest in a much larger body of research. Over the past 10 years, in this report alone, um, we have published 202 extreme event attribution papers looking at over 29 different types of extreme events, from heat waves and precipitation and drought to Arctic sea ice melt, wildfires, and abnormal sea surface temperatures. Of those, about 153 or 76% have found a role for climate change. But in this report, we do publish results regardless of whether a result is or is not found. And 49, about 24% over the past decade have not found a role for climate change. These studies still provide a lot of valuable information on the state of the science and how different methods can be applied in different situations. This was the first year of the BAMS Explaining Extremes event report where a role for climate change was found for all of the events studied. That hasn't happened before. But I will note that the events here in this report do not represent a random sampling of extreme events from around the world. They are very biased towards having occurred where people live and primarily in developed nations. Next slide. Looking back at the last 10 years, today some level of changing risk can be tied to most event types, but still not all. The results in this report reflect the larger body of evidence that has been compiled in the most recent IPCC report. And there is broad agreement that the extent to which scientists can confidently determine how much and in what way climate change is impacting different extreme event types has grown dramatically in the past decade. At this point, understanding climate change's role in a heat wave has become highly routine. And some countries' meteorological offices now issue attribution assessments on temperature in the same way NOAA's weather service would issue a seasonal forecast. Around the world, it's extremely rare now to find a heat event not made worse to some degree by climate change. And of the 30 plus heat events examined in this report over the, over the years, only two were unable to find a role for climate change. Due to the routine nature of heat attribution studies, this report now primarily focuses on other event types where the methodology and the underlying uh, understanding of how climate change may impact an extreme event type are not as well understood. Again, as you can see from this plot, um, this figure, uh, due to sea level rise, there is high confidence that coastal flooding events are also routinely being made worse. Precipitation is a more complicated story, and the role of climate change is intensifying or reducing extreme precipitation events, and how its influence varies based on location and time of year. Andy Hole, the next panelist, will get into additional details on this for the U.S. The complexity around precipitation also translates into making drought analyses more challenging as well, because it is a mixture of both temperature and precipitation drivers. In general, however, it is fair to say that over the past 10 years, we have seen a stronger ability from across most event types to make an attribution analysis. Next slide. And in summation, um, this quote, we are experiencing new weather because we have created a new climate, is from Jeff Rosenfeld. And he actually uh, was the editor in chief of BAMS who managed this report for many years. And when we first started this report 10 years ago, the statement would not have been widely endorsed. But a decade later, it has become somewhat irrefutable. In addition to scientific advancements that have allowed for this improved confidence, it is also clear that as humans continue to emit greenhouse gases, the signal to noise is increasing. While we have better tools with which to perform attribution, the confidence in the results is also growing for some event types simply because it is easier to find the fingerprints of climate change in our day-to-day -day weather and in turn our day-to-day -day lives. Looking ahead, regardless of future emission scenarios, we should expect the impact of human-caused climate change on extreme events to increase and our ability to detect that influence to increase as well. Thank you, and now I will hand it over to Andy Hole from NOAA to tell you more about the Southwestern US drought. Yeah, thank you very much, Stephanie. Just checking, you guys can hear me okay, right? A thumbs up? <laughs> Good, thanks. Uh, I'm Andy Hoyle from the uh, NOAA Physical Sciences Laboratory, and I will present on drought under climate change, focusing on a specific case in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society explaining extreme events from a climate perspective in 2020. Next slide. 
Uh, drought is a cascading hazard that affects different aspects of drought at different times, and consequently, different quantities and time horizons are used to measure it. There are five commonly accepted facets of drought, four of which are physical, and the fifth is socioeconomic, or the effect of drought on humans. The four physical facets of drought are meteorological, agricultural, hydrological, and ecological. Meteorological drought occurs when precipitation is so low that it falls well below the moisture demand by the atmosphere. It's measured by precipitation or a combination of precipitation and evaporation. Meteorological droughts can occur, occur in the order of just a few weeks and last as long as a few years. Agricultural droughts occur when the land surface becomes anomalously dry because of a lack of incoming moisture. It's commonly measured by soil moisture. Agricultural droughts occur on the order of a few months and can last as long as a few years. Agricultural droughts tend to lag behind meteorological droughts because it takes additional time for the land surface moisture to be replenished by precipitation once a meteorological drought has ended. And hydrological droughts occur when water supplies at the surface are low and they're lower than average. It's commonly measured by reservoir capacity, lake levels, or river flows. Hydrological droughts tend to lag behind meteorological droughts and agricultural droughts for the same reason, just because it takes more time for precipitation to make up for those deficits in the land surface. And then finally, ecological droughts occur when a lack of available moisture in or on the land surface affects organisms. It's measured by vegetation health, animal health, ecosystem diversity, and so on. Next slide, please. In terms of the American West, prevalent drought has affected it since 2000, and many studies have examined how climate change has affected different aspects of drought and its effects on society during the last two plus decades. Relevant to this issue of BAM Stripoli in 2020, I led a team of scientists from the NOAA Drought Task Force in examining conditions related to the reemergence of drought in the summer of 2020 over the Southwest during the monsoon season. Indicated on this slide, is the rapid increase in drought aerial coverage and intensity during the four, over the four corner states of Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico between the 26th of May in 2020 and October 6th of 2020. The case of drought reemergence in 2020 provided an opportunity to identify its proximate causes and examine how climate change altered the likelihood of these kinds of cases. Next slide. We found that Southwest drought reemergence in 2020 was related to record low precipitation over the four corner states during June to September of that year. The record low precipitation during this time of year has been called a failed monsoon. The map on the left shows precipitation percentile ranks dating back to 1895 for each climate division in June to September of 2020. These climate divisions were defined by NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information. Precipitation was the lowest on record in all Arizona climate divisions and elsewhere in the four corner states, precipitation was predominantly in the lowest decile. That's the lowest 10% of the historical distribution. The time series on the right shows June to September precipitation over the four corner states from 1895 to 2020 during June to September. The time series reaffirms the record low precipitation in 2020. Also noteworthy is the variability of precipitation during this season over this region from one year to the next and one decade to the next. Those, there, there's a lot to appreciate about this time series. What it doesn't indicate is a trend to drier conditions during this season. Next slide. As is common in climate change attribution studies, we used observations and climate model simulations controlled in a variety of ways to test whether the risk of low precipitation like was observed in 2020 is more likely in a contemporary climate or one with climate change compared to a past climate or one without climate change. We use different models, four in this case, and different experiment types, three in our case, to limit the potential biases introduced by a single model or experiment. Still, what we found was conflicting results. Here we show the relative risk of precipitation falling below given low thresholds. The median, the low decile, that's the low 10% of the distribution, the low ventile, which is the low 5% of the distribution, and finally the low percentile. In the recent climate relative to the past, the dots indicate the relative risk where one means no change, two means a doubling, and values less than one mean a decrease in the risk. The whiskers show the uncertainty. If the whiskers all exceed one, it indicates a statistically significant increase in the risk of an event. And if the whiskers fall below one, it, increase, it, it indicates a statistically significant decrease in the event. 
The observations do not indicate a change in the risk of low precipitation events in a contemporary climate relative to the past. One model experiment suggests no significant change in the risk, while the four other climate models suggest an increase in the risk, hence the conflicting information. Next slide, please. As I showed previously, drought can be quantified in a variety of ways and over different time horizons. Given the prevalence of drought in the last two decades over the American West, researchers have focused on features of this drought from different perspectives. For example, researchers have examined river flows like Colorado and soil moisture, for example, in the Southwest over many decades. What was found in those studies was an increase in the risk of low river flows and low soil moisture due to climate change. The proximate cause identified for these studies is that the increases in temperature lead to a host of effects like increased evaporation and low snowpack that ultimately reduce the amount of available moisture in and on the land surface. All told, the body of work indicates that climate change affects aspects of Southwest drought differently. That is different focus quantities, time horizons and methods yield different results as it relates to a climate change effect on drought in, American, in, in America's West. Thank you, and I believe that Freddie is speaking next. Yes, I believe so too. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Freddie Otto. I'm at the Grantham Institute at Imperial College in London, and um, I will uh, give a brief um, presentation on where sort of the methods started with attribution and where we are going in a particular um, example for rapid event attribution that we have done with world weather attribution, but also uh, with um, the European Climate Service, which is Copernicus, who have run a pilot study on a rapid attribution project. Next slide, please. So in the, um, as Stephanie has said, uh, 10 years ago in the first uh, BAMS report, many um, of the few studies that were there uh, looked something like, uh, like you can see on this slide here, uh, where you have, which is a, a return time plot, so a, a very typical um, result plot for an event attribution study, where you have on the x-axis the return period of the event to occur in years, um, and on the y-axis, you have um, the magnitude of the event. And here we see in red um, simulations of possible warm Novembers in the world we live in today, and in blue simulations of possible warm Novembers in the world that might have been without climate change in this study from, from 2012. And um, these simulations are from a single climate model, which uh, and um, and sort of the discussion, the scientific discussion was, okay, how do we frame the question? We focus on the change of the likelihood of the event to occur, which you can see here in this um, horizontal um, red arrow, where you see that the likelihood of such a warm November has increased dramatically. Um, but, and when you look at the intensity change, um, you can see that there is an increase in the intensity because of climate change, which is the red arrow between the blue and the red, uh, but there's also a role to play of, um, of course, of the natural variability. And so um, a large part of the, of the meteorological situation leading to the extreme event is naturally generated. And so um, from, from at this point in time, there were usually um, discussions on, it was presented that we have two different types of extreme event attribution. One is the probabilistic one, mainly focusing on changing in the likelihood of the event to occur, and then more process-based ones or conditional attribution um, where you have more the meteorological analysis or anatomy of an extreme event. And BAMS has continued to, to, to present both, but um, since then, um, these, they are not so clearly cut very different because you have aspects of both in most attribution studies that can, that, that can be done. If you can could go to the next slide, please. Um, but, and you can use both ideas um, to, to do rapid attribution studies, but I will uh, focus here now on the probabilistic methodology, but that doesn't mean that the other is less informative or, or less valid. 
So in order to do something fast in a sort of operational context, you need not to have a vague idea of what uh, of, of sort of what you want to do, but you need to have a clear protocol of which are the steps you have to go through and how to go through them. And so um, this has been developed over the years um, by um, by, by several researchers who have published repeatedly in BAMS, and where we have um, always aspects that require expert judgment, which models to use, how to define an extreme event, which observational data sets to use, and particularly also how to communicate the results of these reports. And that is really crucially important because quite often, and as, as Andy has just shown, the results are not that straightforward. And, and what we learn from an attribution study is a lot more than just has climate change played a role, yes or no. But we learn a lot about also what the, the meteorological uh, development, the anatomy of the event, but also um, particularly important in, in a recent example um, that we have looked at with our team in a drought in Madagascar is just how crucial exposure and vulnerability are. But what we have also found by trying and applying these protocols and these stringent method methodology of going through the different steps in doing an attribution analysis is that in order to avoid being overconfident in our results, um, we tend to be a bit too cautious. So when you go to the next slide, this is a result um, of uh, a heavy rainfall event in Germany. And it's the same kind of uh, plot that Andy showed, but just to turn 90 degrees. So um, you have here zero would be no change in the likelihood of the event to occur. Um, and these uh, bar plots are the same as the box whisker plots, but turn 90 degrees. And so here we have a heavy rainfall event in a very localized area in Germany. And when you look at the observations here, blue and the models, we see that there is no clear statistical signal on, um, on climate change making this event more likely. And so if we would just report that and just use this localized area, we would have a result of climate change didn't play a role in this heavy rainfall event. But we know from physics and we know from our process understanding that climate change does make heavy rainfall more likely. And so one crucial step to do to make rapid event attribution studies more useful are, is to, to include this physical understanding, at least in the communication of the results of the event to occur, in order to avoid being too conservative. Um, by, by using just the pure statistical results. And if you could go to the last slide. But of course, in some cases, um, you also, you might not want to do that. So it's absolutely crucial when doing rapid attribution and how to do rapid attribution studies and which are the best methodologies to use. You need to think about who is your audience? What do we use this attribution studies for? Do we want to use it just to, to inform ourselves and better understand climate change, then the very conservative methods might be actually very useful because we learn a lot about local factors. But if it's to raise awareness on climate change and to plan adaptation, then it, they might not be useful. And so I think this is an important aspect that we need to include better in the studies. And I'll hand over to John now. All right. Uh... Thank you, Freddie. Um, I am the state climatologist of Texas and has the Texas a and University. I'm also uh, director of the Southern Regional Climate Center, and I'm also one of the editors of the Explaining Extreme Events Supplement. And I was tasked with editing a set of articles on uh, near real-time attribution efforts. Um, and uh, so I want to give a brief summary of what uh, those articles contain, what those efforts are, and how they fit into the perspectives you've heard already. Next slide, please. So the three articles uh, covering future attribution efforts in near real time come from AOTRO New Zealand, Australia, and the United States. Um, and 
each of them share common aspects and also some differences. So for example, the New Zealand effort is a combination of government and university scientists. Uh, Australia is exclusively a government uh, endeavor. Uh, the United States effort is a collaboration of government university scientists also, but it's not an operational effort. It still characterizes a research and experimental effort, whereas the other two are seeking to be um, primarily operational. Um, you also heard earlier that different types of events are more easily attributed than others, and that, for example, temperature is getting a little bit less exciting from a research perspective. Uh, perhaps that's why all three of these efforts are going to start out focusing on temperature-related extremes. Um, Australia and New Zealand are also going to be looking at uh, precipitation extremes, and Australia is specifically looking at uh, uh, extremes related to wildfires, uh, that being a major issue in that part of the world. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, some of the issues that each of these efforts have to confront. First off, what is the purpose of doing the attribution? Um, for all of them, uh, one of the purposes is interest from the general public as to what climate change is doing to uh, extreme weather. Um, for uh, others, um, specific um, areas of purpose for Australia, for example, is decision support and situational awareness, understanding whether you know, past experience with extreme events are going to apply as new events unfold. Um, for um, the United States, um, stated purposes include planning for resilience. Um, so that maybe they'll understand what future extreme events might do in a long time horizon, as well as climate equity, making sure that uh, everybody in society has knowledge of the changing risks associated with climate change. Um, events are going to be identified in different ways from public interest, which events are, are, are being followed closely by the general public. Um, as well as from forecasts of uh, extreme events, Australia actually is looking to have a uh, extreme event attribution in uh, forecast mode, where they're going to be able to uh, seek to say that particular forecast events have a particular for estimated contribution uh, from climate change and changing magnitude or odds. And uh, the three efforts also are going to use different mixes of models and observations, which affects the framing of the event. Uh, all of them are going to use large ensembles, which are uh, model simulations done by particular models, but dozens or even hundreds of simulations, or perhaps thousands, depending on the model, to, to try to explore the range of probabilities for particular events. Um, as well as changes in magnitude under, say, historical conditions and present-day climate conditions. Other techniques that are going to be used include what are called pseudo-global warming simulations, where it's more event-based. You try to uh, initialize the model with the large-scale changes associated with climate change, and embed within that the particular weather configuration uh, just prior to the event you're, you're hoping to attribute. So you can see how those events play out in those different uh, settings. And New Zealand is actually going to look at historical uh, present day climate and then twice the change in climate to see whether the change they get between historical and present day is robust as you continue it on to a future climate framework. And uh, the United States effort is also going to be looking at um, attribution to large scale climate patterns such as El Nino, the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation by using as part of their tool set climate simulations that take observed sea surface temperature patterns and uh, plug in the the atmospheric conditions and you can change then the sea surface configuration and keep the same weather conditions and see how those play out as well, both in an individual event basis and a statistical basis. 
Um, so those are the um, efforts that have been submitted to the Explaining Events Supplement and are going to appear in the issue. Uh, my last slide, I've got uh, my contact information as well as a slide from a uh, poster that we presented uh, at, a at AGU earlier this week on the February 2021 Extreme Cold event. Uh, I imagine you can look forward to uh, rapid uh, but not real-time attribution studies of that event appearing in next year's supplement. So thank you, and I'll turn it back over to the organizers. All right, thank you to our panelists. We're going to move on to the question and answer portion of our session. Just a reminder to the reporters, if you'd like to put your name and your affiliation in the Q&A box, so not the chat, but the Q&A, we'll read those to our panelists or ask you to open your mic and invite you to ask a question live in the order we receive them. Our first question is going to be from Sarah Kaplan at the Washington Post. Sarah, we're going to invite you to open your mic and go ahead when you're ready. Hi, thank you all for um, doing this and for taking questions. Um, I was curious about, so I saw in the um, the report, one of the studies of the extremely warm and wet winter in Northwest Russia um, said that it was only possible due to climate change. And I know Freddie worked on the rapid attribution study of the Pacific Northwest heat wave this summer. Uh, finding that that was virtually impossible without climate change. And I, I wonder, can you talk a little bit about this? I mean, it feels new to me. Maybe maybe it's not new, but it, it feels like there has been, you know, where I don't remember ever hearing about being able to say definitively, like this could not ha have happened in a world without human greenhouse gas emissions. And I'm, can you talk a little bit about, like, is that a testament to the improvements in attribution science is a testament to the just really intensification of some of these extremes that we're seeing. Um, and what does it say that we are now experiencing events that like could not have happened in a world that humans hadn't altered? Should I start? Yeah, um, yeah, that's a good that's a good question, and I think the answer is a bit of both. So uh, I think when when these attribution studies started, usually scientists used one model or two models, but now most of these studies use um, many different models, so that we actually have. Um, yeah, are able to assess how confident are we in these results and how much how much do we just learn about a model and how much do we learn about the real world. And for example, with the Siberia study that I worked on, we have used over 70 different climate models. And in all these climate models, um, this type of event was was based, we couldn't simulate events of the magnitude that were observed uh, in, in the real world without human induced climate change. And so therefore, um, and by using that many models, um, we have a lot more confidence that then we say something about the real world and not just about a model. Um, but also we have already 1.2 degrees of warming and emissions have increased and even the rate of emissions have increased in, in every year in the last years. And so, we also just see we are living in a rapidly warming climate. And so that that also is that is very different to a decade ago. So I think both effects play a role in that we now see these types of events and, and also have confidence in, in their attribution. Yeah, and this is Stephanie. I'll just add that um, it was actually in 2016 when we first, at least in this report, um, we started to see these types of events in particular for heat. So 2016 was a um, heat record for the globe. And there were three different studies that year that looked at various aspects of that from both global um, annual temperature during the course of 2016, um, a heat event over Asia, and the warm waters in the Bering Sea. And in 2016, all three of those studies came out to, and they were done independently by you know, different research groups looking at effectively three different events, but they were all temperature driven and found the, and came to the same result. And I think temperature is where we would have expected to see these types of events, um, the, the sort of the not possible, the inability to replicate them in our, um, as Freddie mentioned, in the simulations of a world without greenhouse gas emissions. 
Um, but as I think, as, as Freddie, Freddie pointed out, as we see the temperature aspect of climate changing more dramatically, and we, the, it's sort of that, that the next thing is for that to sort of fill over into other event types like this warm wet event that we had over um, Siberia this year. So the, the reality is we actually have seen some of these in the past, specific, again, primarily in the heat um, related attribution studies. And the, the expectation is that we would um, expect as the signal increases due to the warming that Freddie mentioned, um, that we'd be able to see the signal from the noise much more clearly going forward as well. Our next question comes from Mark Fischetti at Scientific American. What length of time would elapse in a rapid attribution study versus a near real-time study of an event? Well, this is John Nielsen Gammon. The, uh, the idea for near real-time, I think, uh, would be for it to be um, within um, two or three days of the event taking place, or perhaps while the event taking place, or in the case of a forecast, perhaps even before the event taking place. So the the uh, it's not a clear dividing line. Some of the work that Freddie's done is is, is uh, rapid attribution, which is um, generally has come out fairly quickly within time frame of weeks to uh, a month. So basically we're pushing it to the point where while the event is still in the news, um, the climate change aspect has already been analyzed and assessed. So we're really shooting for a, such a rapid turnaround that uh, it's, it's available almost instantaneously. The one thing I, uh, thanks John, the one thing I would add is like, this is an interesting question, you know, what rapid, timely attribution, we kind of, I uh, think the community has sort of been playing around with what the right terminology here is. And there's also another interesting approach that's being used in Australia, which is actually to use some of the, the forecasts and do an attribution study of the event that is being forecasted. So it's a little bit different than looking at the event after it happens because the attribution study, if the forecast is not accurate, you've got an attribution study on an event that may not actually happen, but to the extent that the forecast is accurate, um, they are actually looking at seeing if an attribution assessment would be released at the same time as a, a sort of the forecast or as the event is in the process of occurring. So different countries are really looking at this differently and it will be very um, exciting to see how the various methodologies from around the world uh, play out as we move forward over the next several years. Yeah, you saw the side, slide that uh, Freddie showed that showed the probabilities of events and the magnitudes. You, once you know the nature of the event, you can generate that sort of chart. And then when the event happens, you can say, okay, this was the magnitude of the observed event. You can instantly read off what the contributions was to climate change according to that method. Do we have any further questions from our reporters in the audience? Looks like we have one that came in. Next question comes from John Blumenfeld, NASA Earth Space Science Data System Program. How will the application of a machine learning to big data climate data records impact model confidence of attribution to these events? I'm not, um, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> um, I'm not, um, so I think machine learning um, can help in, in two aspects with, um, with our confidence and attribution. So one is in um, using machine learning techniques to do the model evaluation, which at the moment is, is, is either done, used to just on statistical properties on, on, on the distribution in observations and models or um, sort of on, um, yeah, does the annual, uh, yeah, annual cycle uh, looks, looks right. So I think that their machine learning using, um, using techniques to identify um, the, the, the event in, in a more 
processed based way rather than just looking at the temperature or the lack of rainfall in a drought you have um, you can use machine learning techniques to identify um, the um, the, the atmospheric pattern as well as as the rainfall signatures and so have have a better um, or have a uh, have an event definition that you can then see if, if your model replicates these aspects correctly. So there, I think for model evaluation, it, it's really, it could be a really useful thing um, and then help us with, with confidence in the results because we have more confidence or less confidence in, um, in, the, in, in the models themselves. And I think it can help, machine learning can help with identifying um, what has actually caused the damages. So if you use machine learning techniques based on, um, on impact data, um, like e ecosystem impacts, or so, so to identify which aspects of the meteorology actually caused the damages, and therefore you can provide an attribution study that is better linked to the actual impacts. So that's the two ways how I can see how machine learning could be really useful in attribution. Yeah, the uh, Australia plans um, include uh, doing multiple linear regression on potential drivers of the events of separating out different types of natural drivers and anthropogenic drivers. And that assumes sort of a linear combination of things. So another way machine learning can potentially help is by untangling these complicated nonlinear aspects. Like, for example, if uh, um, a particular event could only have happened if the um, jet stream was farther south than normal, as it might be during an El Nino event. But yet, given that, you have the certain contribution from climate change that made the storm wetter. Uh, machine learning can help tease out those different aspects of cause and effect and, uh, and, and potentially demonstrate that an event wouldn't, wasn't possible without several factors coming into play simultaneously. Our next question is from Robert McSweeney at Carbon Brief. There's been a lot of talk about tornadoes in the past week. How feasible is that at some point in the future, scientists will be able to conduct an attribution study for a tornado event? Well, I can start this one. Um, and it connects a little bit, I think, to the machine learning question from before. But really, and um, my, my colleague, John, he doesn't have it in his slides today, but he has a great slide on this, the three pillars of sound attribution. And it, it emanates from uh, the, a National Academy study that was done on attribution methodology several years ago. But really, there are three things that make up um, that, that you're needed in order to be able to perform an attribution study with some level of confidence. And in my slides, when I showed that spectrum of events with tornadoes in the very little understanding to heat events, that what separates those three things and how, what separates those event types is um, really the first is the quality of the observational record. And as we all have probably know already, the quality of the observational record for something like heat is very robust, in particular in you know, regions like North America and Europe. Um, in addition, in the, up to the instrumental record, you have paleoclimatological records. That isn't the case for tornadoes. It's sort of the, again, the 180 opposite on the spectrum where the observational record is not particularly strong and until satellites. Um, it was really difficult to actually get a strong record, not just that an event happened or not, but intensity, you know, tornado track, et cetera. Um, the other, of course, is the ability of models to simulate the actual event, right? So when we look at climate change and the modeling that we've referred to many times, um, you can think of it almost like uh, uh, you know, in, in public health, which is actually where some of the statistical methodology that we use has been um, adopted from, is that there's a control group. When you do a public health study, for example, on smoking, you look at a cohort of people that do and don't smoke, and you look at the change in risk of lung cancer. Well, in climate change, we're, there is no cohort that has not been influenced by greenhouse gases. And so we use models to simulate a world that in which greenhouse gas emissions have not occurred. But that model also needs to be able to simulate the extreme event that you're interested in looking at. And as you know, even tornadoes, they're incredibly difficult to even forecast at this point. Never mind, um, those types of events are do not not, uh, lend themselves well to um, not being modeled easily. So unlike heat events, for example, which the models lend themselves incredibly well to, and we've shown time and time again that models um, verify quite nicely. 
relative especially to the observational record, they can really replicate the observational record quite nicely. Um, also, the, the mechanisms of change are actually known. So we have to go in with some understanding of the physical drivers of the event and how climate change might be impacting those particular drivers. And again, take an event like heat, we understand 1.2 degrees of warming, the thermodynamics behind that, all very well understood over you know, a very long time. The, and um, our knowledge of that just continues to grow. How those drivers would impact all of the different factors that come together to create a tornado are still areas where we don't have a lot of um, a, a good deep understanding of those things. And so when we refer to those three pillars, observational record, can your model simulate it, and are the mechanisms of change known? Something like heat, they're very, very strong pillars. And for something like tornadoes, uh, they are not. And so, it, so certainly, I mean, I would you know, leave it open to the other panelists and I'd welcome them to chime in, but it's hard to envision that changing um, anytime when I say near future, you know, five, 10 years, but I've been surprised before. So maybe I'm underestimating things, but um, I, I still think that attribution of, confident attribution of tornadoes, uh, in my perspective, is still a little ways off. But I would welcome the perspective of John in particular from, from Texas, if he has thoughts on this one and Freddie. I guess you just teed me up on that one. OK, so um, yeah, I agree with, uh, with everything you said, basically. I would point out that what we will likely see and may actually indeed see with this event is attribution of tornado environments. Uh, we have good observations of things like uh, wind shear and convective instability, things that contribute to the environments that are conducive to tornadoes. And we're, we're learning more and more in the forecasting realm about particular combinations that can lead to particularly dangerous tornadoes. And so we're seeing more confident uh, forecasts a day or two in advance of major tornado outbreaks. So that sort of approach is possible. Um, we, we don't we're, we're, we're seeing literature uh, coming out from scientists that are helping to tease out how different aspects of the storm environment are changing due to climate change. And so we're going to get, I think, bits and pieces of attribution from saying, yeah, this environment, uh, the wind shear would not have been as strong or the, the instability would not have been as great and that sort of thing. Um, the degree to which that can accurately attribute uh, climate change to particular events really does go along with our ability to forecast those events. And as you probably understand, we can you, you still get busts in severe weather forecasts. They, sometimes they pan out, sometimes they don't. And the level of confidence in doing model-based attribution will go along with the level of confidence of being able to forecast these things more accurately. Yeah, I think just to add very briefly, I think we will see storyline type of attribution studies on tornadoes in the next few years, but I don't think, uh, like Stephanie, that we will see uh, anytime soon probabilistic attribution on, on tornadoes themselves, but, but aspects of tornado conducive weather. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think getting down to the grid point scale in a given location, say Lexington, Kentucky, and saying, okay, can our model actually do this? It's, it's, a, pretty, it's a stretch right now. The physics of the models aren't really there yet. The grid space and the grid, the grid points aren't either. So what we do is we look at preconditions. So what, what conditions precede, say, a tornado or a tornadic environment, like John was saying, and then attributing those, those factors. We have a follow-up question from Sarah Kaplan at the Washington Post. Sarah, go ahead when you're ready. Um, hi, thank you for letting me to ask another question. Um, I'm also, you know, wondering kind of more broadly speaking, can you talk a little bit about what the, you know, looking at the, the BAMS reports as a whole and, and thinking about the near future, like what do these varieties of studies about varieties of different kinds of extreme events say about the climate in which we are all living now, um, the kinds of uh, weather events that people should be expecting um, to experience, you know, in this coming year, in the next few years. I think, you know, things like the IPCC report kind of project out into the distant future, but that can feel quite distant to a lot of people. And, and you know, I'm curious if you can just talk a little bit about like what, um, you know, how, how fast this is all evolving and, and what we should expect, um, you know, coming right around the corner. 
that's a very open question. I, I think I'll just briefly start. Um, so I think what's really, really important is that these attribution studies in, in BAMS and also the ones that are done elsewhere are really not representative. There are a lot more and lot different types of extreme events that are happening and really not all of them are being made more likely or more intense because of climate change. So there is also uh, a huge role of natural variability and it, uh, the damages are to a very large degree driven by vulnerability and, and exposure. So um, we are in many cases and places not adapted to today's climate or, or to, to a climate within the natural variability of, of the climate system. I think that's, that's really important. So um, just, looking for the very large changes is not, not necessarily showing what actually the biggest problems are that we have in terms of adaptation and, and resilience building. Um, so because I think, and, and also um, we see the strongest changes from climate change and extreme weather in heat events. So a strong increase in, in, in heat waves and decrease in cold waves. And, uh, and of course, that's, that's really important. And that's particularly important also in parts of the world where we don't get heat attribution studies because heat waves are not being rec even recorded and are not, not on, on anyone's radar. So I think that's a, that is a really important aspect that heat waves are, that, that we, while we know that climate change is an absolute game changer there, that really doesn't mean that society is prepared for them. In, in, in any way. So um, yeah, I think that's probably not necessarily what we learn from what we, what we see in, in the BAMS reports, but I think that's what we also learn a lot from what we don't see. And when you, when you look at the IPCC assessments on the attribution studies, you see that there are huge global gaps, geographical gaps of where we don't have attribution study, where we don't know what's going on. And that yeah, that's at least as important as where we do know what's going on. Yeah, I would just add to that, um, that, you know, as Freddie pointed out, the, and, and I mentioned in my slides, the selection of where attribution studies occurs is, is certainly by no stretch of the imagination in any way a random sampling. Um, so there are very large gaps in our knowledge, in particular, based on geography, um, and in including in some cases event types as well. Uh, but you know, I mean, bar, I won't go as far as you know issuing a seasonal forecast or anything. Um, Noah has an office that does that. But uh, in terms of you know, I think that one of the key takeaways though from the IPCC, from this study, and from all the attribution studies that we see in the peer-reviewed literature is that you know, yes, natural variability is still very much a part of our lives. Um, but that the, you know we can see the role of climate change happening today, and that it is um, this isn't something that you have to you know wait 50 years to experience. You're you're most likely living in a place that's experiencing it in some way, shape, or form today. In terms of the you know, vulnerability aspects, we've continue you know for the most part we still in general um, a lot of the adaptation that we are in, engaged in tends to use um, information that may be historical patterns. And so from that perspective, I think one of the things that we learn from attribution in general is that the weather of the past may not be a predictor of weather of the future. And so if we want to address vulnerability, adaptation, um, and ensuring equity in terms of how people are able to be resilient to extreme events, understanding where we're headed in the future is going to be very important. Yeah, and what I'd like to say about the future is hopefully public perception of extreme events will become more sophisticated as attribution becomes more commonplace. Uh, right now, I think for a large portion of the public, the general expectation is that extremes are becoming worse, and that tends to bleed into all extremes becoming worse. Um, Freddie mentioned casually, cold events becoming less common. That's true. That's a very robust finding, but yet I frequently in kind of people who think that the cold event in February 2021 was obviously something that was enhanced by climate change. Um, the full story hasn't come out yet. Uh, there have been studies that looked at, for example, the role of Arctic sea ice as a contributing factor, but to do attribution, that involves looking at all factors, including global climate change. 
Um, so um, hopefully as, you know, as we move forward, the, the, the knowledge becomes more subtle and people are better able to understand which factors are, are, you know, which extreme events are actually becoming worse and map that onto the threats to their own locations, their own homes, their own businesses, their own economic activity and various countries around the world as it becomes more equitably distributed in terms of attribution. And we have a follow-up question from Robert McSweeney at Carbon Brief. What is the panel's view on advanced attribution studies based on forecasts of extreme events before they have actually occurred? For example, there was a study of Hurricane Florence in 20, 2018. Will we see more of these in the future? Just briefly, you'll definitely see them from Australia because that's uh, part of the plan to, to do forecast-based attribution. Um, you can, you can also, you know, in principle, it's possible to do attribution of events that haven't occurred and never will occur. You could say, if such an event occurred, this is how much the contribution is based on what we know about model simulations of, of these events. So that's definitely all possible. And it would not be surprising to see private companies starting to move into that realm, because I think there's a lot of public interest in that sort of thing. I think it would be important, though, um, to to then compare the forecast-based attribution with the actual um, realization of the forecast, because we, um, in our very first world weather attribution studies, we based them on the forecast, and then turned out the heat wave in some of the cities actually was a degree colder than forecasted, and so the numbers for the real event were quite different. Which um, I don't think it matters. That um, so I think it's still for most purposes still really informative to have the numbers for the forecast, but I think it's important that um, that in the communication it's clear somewhere that how exactly you define the event has a strong influence on your attribution results, and and that that um, that you might end up with a forecast that actually doesn't fit your experience. And then there's a real danger there that people see that the forecast is wrong and therefore the climate attribution is wrong and people think climate scientists are wrong about the role of climate change. So that's, that's a danger when we move into forecast attribution. Do we have any more questions from our reporters in the audience? There should be one more from Josh. From Josh, what can we do better as communicators to better present these data and this information about attribution studies? I think I think for me the most important thing is to to clearly communicate the context, um, so the vulnerability and the exposure and what role that played and not just uh, the number on, on the hazard, which I think is not just on the communicators or also on the scientists, but I think that's really important. And, and also report on events that have not been made more likely, because I think, as, as John has said earlier, in the public, we're very far from having a realistic picture of what extreme events and climate change mean and so i think the the, the non-results and the results for climate change is only marginally important uh, are are at least as important as 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 the almost impossible because of climate change yeah i would emphasize the if statement because all attribution approaches make assumptions for example model-based attribution assumes the models are correctly simulating not just the physics behind the event, but also how they're changing. So every single attribution statement is contingent on some set of assumptions. And so when you're reporting on a, a study, look out, look under the hood at what, what are those assumptions and 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 those you know different studies can make different assumptions. And we really gain confidence in climate change's role in a particular event if you have multiple approaches which have multiple assumptions coming to the same conclusion, or sometimes they'll come to different conclusions, which shows how the assumption is even more important. 
Yeah, I would emphasize context and value. Why is the study valuable? Uh, what is the risk tolerance of a given area? What's the vulnerability? I know Freddie talked about this a little bit. We do this in extreme event attribution globally and especially in food insecure areas. Uh, that's a real focus there. We focus a little bit less on, on the quantities, like three times more likely due to climate change. Well, what does that actually mean? Well, it means something different to everybody because of where they are and what their risk tolerance is. So, uh, and then getting back into what John was saying about how we reconcile our models with our observations and different methodologies and the, the quality of our tools. That's kind of under the hood when it comes to being a scientist. That we, we do try to express that a little bit when it comes to communicating those results as caveats, but not bogging down the message, what the risk is, um, because that just complicates the matter that much more. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say that I do think um, I'm actually, you know, very routinely impressed, I think, with how um, the media and um, I think science reporters in, in the science world have been able to communicate what is a very complicated thing to communicate. Um, it's changing rapidly as well. I know that for some folks who have been following this field for a long time, um, the messages have evolved over time as the science has changed. And I think that the in general, <clears throat> the media has done a very good job on, on this particular in topic of trying to keep up to speed with what is a quickly evolving field and like the tornado case was a good example um you know where we're like well we can't make an assessment today on tornadoes but can we start looking at the environments in which tornadoes are occurring um, who knows where we'll be in five ten years on some of these and so i think that um continuing to uh you know be able to adapt and stay agile to whatever the new developments are is, is part of the conversation um but i think that the other uh aspect here is, in addition to some of the, the risk piece that people have brought in, I mean, this is actually a, a term that Freddie had coined of impact attribution. You know, one of the areas in which I think it would be great to see um, climate science be able to connect more with is the science of um, socioeconomics and understanding when these events occur, how do we link that to impacts? You know, like Andy said, so a climate scientist says, oh, that was three times more likely. But from an impact perspective, what does that really mean? And that actually is a, um, oftentimes anyway, a group of folks with different levels of expertise on how that's playing out on the ground, whether it be um, you know, famine and some of the work that Andy has done, or even, you know, the, the flooding um, from Hurricane Harvey or in, in Texas where John is, John is, I think that there's that ability to start connecting our science to what's really the impacts are. And um, so that for me is very exciting, but hope that we'll make more progress in that direction as well, to be able to really translate what does three times more likely mean to people on the ground. All right, and we're going to squeeze in one vast, very quick question from Sarah Kaplan at the Washington Post before we close. Thank you, uh, it's me again. Um, I was just curious, I remember a few years ago covering the Extending Extremes Report, someone talked about the notion that the ability to attribute extreme events to climate change could have legal implications um, or at least help with sort of holding institutions accountable for um, preparation or lack thereof for these events that like, if we know they're linked to climate change, we know they're becoming more likely. And I'm just curious if there's any, um, yeah, if you have any thoughts about where things are now compared to, I think this was 2018, it was when AGU was in DC. Um, but yeah, just if you have any thoughts on that. It's happening. Um, there, are, there are increasingly a large number of cases being filed. Um, a, a PhD student of mine just published a paper where he looked at 80 ongoing cases and found that um, while these cases make, uh, make the, the attribution argument, they often don't use the state-of-the-art attribution signs. So I think there is uh, at the moment still a bit of a gap between legal practitioners and the science community. And that's on the one hand where we actually have stronger information, but also quite often these cases are on extremely difficult to attribute events. Um, and so, but I think this is a relatively straightforward to close gap that will be closing and, and legal practitioners are increasingly 
seeking out scientists and, and asking for, for advice. So I think it's a space that will definitely get um, a lot more attention and, and even more cases than, than there are. And I think it's just a question of time of when we will see um, the first successful ones on, on particularly on, on attribution, especially after this year where we've seen a lot of successful cases on, um, on more stringent climate, climate policy. And with that, I think we're going to have to bring this session to a close. Big thanks to our panelists today and to everyone who attended. And I'm going to pass the mic quickly over to my colleague, Becca, for final comments. Yeah, thanks again to the panelists and reporters who joined us for this press conference. I just want to note that our next event is a press conference on updates from the latest Perseverance research in Jezero Crater on Mars, and that will begin at 11 a.m. Central Time. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you at a future press event, too. Have a good one.